home now if you want. <laughs> thank you so much, Steve. And thank you guys for having me. This is the first time, no, it's the second time I've been here. The first time I was here, a swim coach was courting me. And I was 17 and I got really scared because the buildings were really big and it seemed like an actual college. And everyone I talked to scared me. And religion scared me. Everything about the place scared me. <laughs> but you don't look scared. You look like you're all right. <laughs> um, so this is the second time I've been here. And I'm not scared. I'm going to read something of an essay to you. Raise your hand if you've ever tried writing a braided narrative. Do it higher. This is a braided essay, and all I mean by that, you know, a hair braid, is more than one strand of story, right? Kind of going back and forth. And you'll hear them. There, it's, I'm not subtle. I'm not a subtle writer, so you'll hear the different strands. And I get asked often, in fact, why I write so often about violence. Because I do. But I've been thinking about that question lately, and I think it would be more accurate, from my point of view, to say that I'm trying to unwrite violence as it's been delivered to me by my culture in ways I've been asked to consume it. So you can tell me if that sounds plausible, because this piece is an attempt at that. Did that make sense, what I just said? It's like I want to get in there and unwrite what I've been asked to accept. What if I say it that way? Better? <laughs> okay. So the story is called Woven. Again, because subtle narrative braid named it Woven. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the bar, but I remember I was 22 and I was having the time of my life on Halloween night with my then girlfriend in Greenwich Village. At 22, we could drink like beautiful and androgynous, unafraid fish. Young badass women in the bohemian capital of the world, New York City. That's how it felt to me anyway. She was a student. I wasn't anything, having flunked out of college. We had plans that spanned continents. Youth foreshortens everything. Faces. Lives. Partway through a shit ton of cheap vodka shots, she got up on our rickety little wooden bar table and danced. And when I say danced, I mean she punched the air like a boxer girl. So I climbed up on my chair and danced just underneath her, and she started laughing uncontrollably, pointing, pointing at my midsection. Because my skirt was tucked up into my neon blue tights enough that my neon blue butt was showing, and I guess I'd made some kind of miscalculation the last time I used the bathroom. We laughed that kind of deep-throated, about-to-be women laugh, the laugh of girls before their voices thin out and tighten from the exhaustion called womanhood. In fact, and it's only because I'm old and I no longer give a crap that I can tell you this, I laughed so hard I made a little unstoppable poop in those neon blue tights like a perfectly round deer turd. It was a night I never wanted to end. Or I wish with all my heart that the story ended there. Mythic youth. But that's not where the story ended. When I was four years old, my Lithuanian grandmother told me a folktale about the water spirit, Laume. I'd accidentally locked myself in my grandparents' bathroom, and I'd gone into hysterics when I couldn't get out. My father was furious at my ineptitude. His yelling nearly broke down the door. And this is the story she told me after I came out. Laume the spirit came from transcendental waters, and her spirit therefore lives in all waters, even in baths and showers, in rivers, streams, oceans, the rain, even toilets. She is the guardian of all children, the not yet born, the newly born, the orphan, the forgotten, even the dead children. If there's a child coming into the world, she can foresee it. If a child is mistreated, she will sometimes take him and raise him herself. If a child is lost, she protects him while gathering information about the usefulness of the parents. 
Above all, she values sincerity. And next to that, industriousness on the part of mothers, particularly the women's work of weaving. Laume rewards those who work hard and she punishes severely those who seek reward without an attention to hard work and those in pursuit of self-aggrandizement. Now go look underneath your pillow to see what she has left you for treasure. I walked upstairs to the bedroom. My whole body shook. I stood in the bedroom a long minute with my eyes closed, waiting for hands on my shoulders. I looked around for my father there in the dark with me because that's the life I had, a father there in the dark, hands on shoulders. But he wasn't anywhere. So I looked underneath my pillow. There was a little star about the size of a hand woven from straw. Laumes take many forms and inhabit many tales, and one of the most famous Laumes was a fisherman's daughter named Aigle, Queen of the Serpents. One day, Aigle finds a large eel in her clothes after swimming in the Baltic Sea, like you do. <laughs> Sorry, I just picture this eel in my underwear and it scares me. The eel takes her clothing and only returns it when she promises to marry him. And when she accepts, the eel becomes a handsome young man named Zilvanus. They live underwater together and have three children, two sons and a daughter. And after a time, Egla longs to visit her parents and siblings on land because she misses them. Zilvanus is terrified that Egla's former family will reject her. But even though he's worried, he agrees to let her go and bring their children. Zilvanus instructs Egla to call him. If you are alive and well, come back to me in a milky wave. If you are dead or harmed, in a bloody way. When she arrives to visit her earthly family, Egla's brothers, jealous of her freedom, torture her sons to death. Her daughter, smitten with one of the earth brothers, betrays the secret and calls, lures Zilvanus to shore, where he is then murdered. When Egla returns to the lip of the water, she sees a bloody wave and learns that her earth brothers have betrayed her. She curses herself and her daughter, turning them into trees forever. Many infant girls in Lithuania still have the names of trees. In the ninth year of our 11-year marriage, my second husband emerged from our kitchen pointing a gun at me. I haven't written much about this, at least not literally. I don't ever talk about it. It's a bit like a little malformed myth still lodged between my heart and my rib cage. In America, it's tricky to describe violence without it turning into entertainment. A Sig Sauer P229 9mm handgun, statistically the most popular handgun in the United States. I just entered the house after work. The kitchen light was on, but not the living room light. So he was backlit. The whole house smelled like Jameson's. I stood in the dark. My car keys were still in my hand. He crossed the space between us. When he was maybe three feet away, he stopped. The gun was pointed at my chest, the air in my lungs concrete. I walked the rest of the distance between us until the gun was between my breasts. That's how I know he was crying. I stared at my second husband. Nothing moved in the house except our breathing. Stop loving me, he finally said the gun heavy enough for me to feel my sternum ache, as if my love was killing him. Stop loving me. No, I said, and I closed my eyes and I put my arms around him and pressed in and I waited for the possible death moment between a man and a woman. Walking straight into violence wasn't new to me. I'd learned how to walk deliberately and unflinchingly into violence from father like so many other children in this country. In fact, in this country, we raise all of our children on one form of violence or another. And so my question is not, why did you walk into that violence? My question is, where does my love come from that I walk through male violence to find it? 
Lamies are the oldest spirits of Lithuanian mythology, and the images of them may have developed during the historical Mesolithic period, just after the Ice Age. She first appeared in the form of animals, like goats and bears or mares. Later, she took on a half-human appearance, usually bird claws for feet, the lower body of a she-goat, and large stone nipples. Later still, she was represented as a beautiful and supernatural water woman creature with fair hair and skin the color of the moon. Laumes were both benevolent and dangerous. They could tickle men to death or they could eat their bodies. They could protect women and children or punish them brutally. Anyone who knows me knows why I'm attracted to Laume spirits. I'm a child of waters. But then, so are all of us before the breach. I had a recurring dream for 20 years that I would have three sons. I did not have three sons, and I'm 55, so it's not looking good. What I did have was a daughter who died, one son, the son of my life. I did have three husbands. Maybe dreams don't mean a goddamn thing. Or maybe they mean everything. They say you marry a man who is like your father. My father, the artist turned architect, molested and beat us. He was angry and loud fisted, and he marked us forever, three little women making for their lives. My first husband was more gentle than a swan, a painter with long fingers and eyelashes, beautiful, beautiful. You can kind of see what I was shooting for. I almost self-immolated next to his beautiful passivity. I didn't know what to do with it. My second husband, another painter, used harsh lashing strokes on the canvas, and he was big and he was loud, but he was made softer by alcohol and art, except for when he wasn't the gun of him, Sig Sauer. My third husband, father of my son, he's big and he's loud, but he's a filmmaker, and there's the gentleness of a cellist is in his hands and eyes. So sometimes I wonder if my dream was meant to show me not three sons, but three husbands. Take my second husband, for instance, the one who pressed the gun of him to me. He was a lot like a child. I wonder if Lao Mei came and took my baby daughter, who died right before I met him, and replaced her with a man-child. This is kind of how we get through our lives, isn't it? We tell ourselves stories so that what's happening becomes something we can live with. Necessary fictions. I mean, that didn't really happen, right? But don't we make stories so that we can bear our own life truths? Maybe I had some hard lessons to learn about the difference between doing good work and trying too hard to be a woman. Woman like anyone even knows what that is, still. Or violence. Maybe this really is a story about violence. Or maybe I'm still looking for a way to forgive myself for that failure of womanhood. Two marriages in a row gone bust, oh Jesus woman. I keep waiting to feel like a failure. I wonder what would happen if I didn't know what this story was about. I think it might be a children's story. It's said that Laume was a silken-haired sky goddess who lived in the clouds, and in one myth, she falls in love with a beautiful young man down on earth, and they have a son. And Laume descends to earth from the sky to feed her son with her breasts, but when the highest god found out about the son and the sacrilegious love, he killed the boy and scattered his remains between the stars and the sky, and he cut Laume's breasts. Stone pieces of them are said to be found on Earth in the form of sea creature fossils. You have no idea how many sea creature fossils I have at my house right now. If you saw them, it would embarrass you. I'm going to try it again. When I was 22, I spent Halloween night in Greenwich Village. I drank vodka in a Russian bar with my girlfriend at the time a huge middle-aged Russian man and his male 
fat companion said Russian things to us all night, not a word of which we understood. And we laughed and they laughed and we toasted and things seemed strangely okay like when you're young and drunk. And I kept yelling, I'm Lithuanian to the Russian men like that was something. Later in life I'd learn what an idiotic thing that was to be yelling at the Russians. But at the time it seemed everyone, even the moon, was laughing and drunk and beautiful. At midnight, a giant parade of costume Halloween people passed the bar, and so we joined them, and we walked for miles together. There were animals like goats and bears and horses and unicorns and centaurs. There were bird claws for feet and the lower bodies of she-goats and large extended tinfoil breasts, exaggerated cod pieces, and all sorts of witches and fairies and mermaids and water people. It was one of the happiest nights of my life. We were two girl women in love. We were walking with an army of people in Halloween costumes more vivid and outrageous than reality would ever be. Fear was nothing about us. Later on, we found ourselves a few alleys away from her crappy dorm room, and we were stumble walking arm in arm, and we kissed and teetered along and laughed, and I put my hand up her shirt, and she put her hand down my pants, and then I saw her head lurch forward in a not right way, and she made a sound, or something did, like someone smashing a pumpkin with a bat, something hard at my back, and then my side imploding. Two men had come up behind us. One hit her in the skull with a baseball bat, another stabbed me in the lower back and side with a knife. My girlfriend dropped to her knees, her head hitting the pavement. I saw her pr body perfectly balanced for a second there, head and knees keeping her perched, upright, blood everywhere. I saw the two men laughing and yelling. I saw their shaved heads. I saw stars before I passed out. The last thought I remember thinking was skinheads. There's language enough to describe it. But going there is beyond language, so mostly I don't. I don't know how to belong to the story in a way that doesn't betray it. I don't even want to be in the story, the one in which the woman I loved, I loved, I loved, was left paralyzed. Mostly I don't tell the story because I didn't stay with her happily ever after, forever and ever and ever. I've noticed the scar at my back and side has softened over the years. It's so tiny you can barely see it, receding with age and fat, I suppose, or the guilt of having wanting, wanted more life. A woman was harvesting a flower bed and had taken her child with her. She was so busy with her work that the child slept through the day. And the woman went home in the evening to milk the cows and make dinner, and she served her husband, who asked her, where's my son? With terror, she whispered, I've forgotten him. And she ran as fast as she could to the place where she'd left her son, and she heard Laomi speak to her. Hush. The mother asked Laomi for her child back, and the fairy said, hush. Come, woman, take your child back. We've done nothing to him. We know that you work very hard at many jobs, mother wife, person who puts love in the world, and you didn't mean to leave your child behind. The Laomes went on to shower the babe with treasures, enough gifts to raise several children on, and the mother went home with her precious baby and her gifts, and she was greeted with great joy. But another woman, hearing of this good fortune, was taken over by jealousy, and she thought, I shall do the same as that woman, and I'll also be showered with gifts. The next evening at dusk, she took her child and left him in the fields and went home. When, after dinner, she returned to the field, she heard the Laomes, Hush, you left your child in greed. And the child screamed with great pain, for he was being pinched mercilessly. And the Laomes continued their torture, torture until the mother approached, and then they tossed the child at her feet. The babe was dead. Nothingness was her prize. When my infant daughter died, spilling out of our shared waters, the story breached. Every story I've ever told has that kind of reach to it, I think. You could say that my writing isn't quite right, that all the beginnings now have endings in them. Violence doesn't only exist in men. 
It's a big sentence. Think of mother violence, for example. When my son was in grade school, I had hysterically violent thoughts. I was afraid he would be bullied because he was tender-hearted immediately. I actually pictured the moment. I saw myself stride across the school grounds, pick a bully child up by his ankles, hold him up in the air upside down, shake the living shit out of him, and fling him in a dust dumpster. I mean, I saw that image several times, just in case. I thought all the way through the fantasy to telling my son, I'm sorry, baby, mama has to go to jail because <laughs> of that kid in the dumpster. My Lithuanian grandmother cut the tip of my father's tongue as a boy for swearing. After I became a mother and married for the third time, I had a skinhead in my writing class. I know he was a skinhead not from the way he looked, though that's exactly what he looked like, the 90s version of a London skinhead. I know he was a skinhead because he came to my office and told me, like in office hours. He asked to not ever have to do group work. And I'm ashamed to admit, I started laughing when he said that. Of course he didn't want to do group work. I also remember sitting there thinking, you're kind of a brutal abomination, but also at the same time, not long ago, this guy was just a boy, just his mother's son. What the hell happened? His writing? was impeccable. He completed every assignment. His theses were not Hitler-esque. He was oddly polite and courteous. I gave him a C minus only because I could, whether or not I should have. If he challenged the grade, he'd have won. In many ways, he was the best writer in the class. What is a teacher? What is a mother? Another Laomei is a goddess of the home and hearth and warmth. If you do not tend to your family and fire well, she burns your whole house down with everyone inside. The word for fireplace in Lithuanian has come to be understood as family relations. In my 23rd year of teaching college, on a day we were discussing violence as a theme, something repressed inside me sort of lurched and I told my Halloween night story to the entire class. I mean, it shot out of my mouth before I could stop it. Sig Sauer like. I lifted up my shirt. I showed them my scar. It was one of the more unprofessional teaching moments of my career, though it certainly would not be the last. So much shame came out of my mouth that day. The shame of a daughter whose body was written by father the shame of leaving a woman I loved, I loved, I loved. The shame of failed marriages and motherhoods. At the end of the story, I also told them what I'd learned about our attackers. They weren't skinheads. They'd been Marines. My then girlfriend would be neurologically damaged and paralyzed for the rest of her life. And the Marines spent three months, 90 whole days, in jail. One of them was dishonorably discharged. Everyone got quiet. I thought maybe the story was over, and my intention was to get us all writing and out of the well of overly personal pathos I'd let us fall into. But then a Latino man in the back of the class, his neck covered in tattoos, stood up. All I knew from his writing was that he'd been a gang member, that he'd made mistakes and gone to jail, that he was writing A-plus ideas with D-plus skills, that his parents were undocumented workers, that he had four sisters, and I learned that day he'd also been on three tours of duty for our country before he turned 22. I also learned the military had begun relaxing tattoo restrictions in 2004. He stood up in the back. I apologize on behalf of Marines. The sentence was perfect, the air in the room vacuumed. And then he walked the length of the room straight at me. And I braced for the moment. I wasn't sure how much longer I could keep from crying. Briefly, it occurred to me that I might die if he got any closer, closer than, say, three feet away. 
And then he did a regular human thing. He hugged me. And he said it again, this time in my ear, and his breath made the hairs on my neck shoot up. I apologize on behalf of the Marines. But that's not what I heard. I heard, you don't have to punish yourself for love. I didn't die like I thought I might, from his random compassion, I mean. I wasn't a very good teacher. I don't know what I was. I gave him an A in the class. Should I have? Should I not? That day we wrote stories about the small violences in our daily lives. In one story, Lamwe takes all the children away from their parents in a village because they sent their eldest boys to war. The mothers become barren and the fathers can no longer hold any food down and thus they all die. The village fades from history because the parents did not take care of their children. You know, stories change, just like the lives we've lived and the selves we've inhabited. Nobody's been the same person twice. I mean, really, it's the people walking around acting and sounding especially self-assured and whole who worry me the most. I like hearing the world's stories about itself. That's partly why I teach literature. It helps me feel less incarcerated by the world or my past or my mistakes and confusions. It helps me remember I'm not just American, thank oceans. I'm not just a woman, a mother, a teacher, a wife. I find value in thinking in stories. Aren't we all woven through with stories? Isn't that how we think of our lives and how we survive them? Now, when someone hurts me, and they hurt me, I remember that they're only living the terms of their own fictions, sometimes desperately, so their selves don't unravel. I like that idea, maybe, a woven person. Like we're little misshapen stars made of straw. Thank you.